All right. So today we're going to be talking about self-directed learners and how we develop self-directed learners. Um, so what is that? Um, what kinds of um, things can we promote in our students to make them self-directed learners? Um, and how can we help them with that um, and support their learning? So I'll be your presenter today. I'm uh, Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I earned my PhD from NIU in 2016, and I've been teaching college English for over 15 years. I've um, been uh, in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU since 2019. So I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have specific questions related to what we're discussing, feel free to post that in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them as they come up um, and I'll address them. So you can do this in the text chat or you can just unmute yourself. Um, but what's your department or division? What's your role? What do you hope to get out of this workshop? All right, um, I can go first. Yeah. So my name is Clayton Kamek. I'm a professor of exercise physiology. And um, I'm just basically trying to uh, learn new things. This is actually the first uh, like city uh, program that I've uh, signed up for. Great. And so, yeah, just trying to learn new things. I know a lot of my students definitely struggle with, I think, just figuring out how to be a student mm -hmm. and how to be motivated and Yeah, definitely. I think that's, and especially since the pandemic, I think it's become even more of, um, of kind of an issue too. Great. Um, Catherine? Hi, Katie Sawinski. I'm a PhD student in art education, and we're seeing in our capstone course that students are really struggling with self-monitoring their own learning, so getting some ideas for that. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk um, about a few different things today. Uh, first is metacognition. Um, and we'll touch on these things. Obviously, we could do a series of workshops on each one of these, but we'll just get a kind of a taste of these today. Um, but metacognition, growth mindset, and especially um, compared to um, fixed mindset, what those things are um, and why we want to foster growth mindset in our students, as well as ourselves um, and the self-directed learning cycle. So our objectives by the end of the workshop, we should be able to define the term metacognition, explain what um, the concept of growth mindset is, and explain how the self-directed learning cycle could be used in a course. And we'll talk, kind of brainstorm some ways that we can use that in our courses. Um, so our focusing question is, what techniques do you use to encourage students to be self-directed learners in your course? So um, are there any strategies that you're currently using that are working or that aren't working? Um, what, what is your experience right now? Um, I can go. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes checklists with due dates for larger projects to help them with time management and break down big tasks into littler tasks. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it, has that worked pretty well for your students? For most of them, yes, but I'm also looking for support for students who seem to lead, need a little bit more hand holding. Mm -hmm. Okay. One thing that I do is provide kind of uh, expectations and keys to success on the syllabus. Mm -hmm. And I talk about specifically, like, you know, what definitely worked for me in terms of studying and staying on top of the material. Um, and so I'll talk about that at the beginning of the semester and then prior to each exam. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that um, coming back to it is de throughout the semester is definitely a, an important piece because um, I know at least when I have things in my syllabus, my students um, don't go back to the syllabus unless I tell them to do that. Um, so so it's definitely important to, to keep repeating those things for our students. Um, so let's talk just briefly about metacognition. Um, so it's basically thinking about thinking, the process of reflecting on and directing your own thinking. Um, and this is something that we want to uh, encourage in our students to think about their thinking, think about why they're doing things, to um, think about the, the best ways for them to approach their learning. And one way to do that is through growth mindset. Um, just a person's mindset in general is their belief about their abilities and their intelligence. Um, and that's from Dweck, but we have different kinds of mindsets in our students. We have growth mindset, which we want, and then we have a fixed mindset. So the characteristics of a fixed mindset is maybe our goal is to look smart. Um, we tend to avoid challenges. We give up easily if something doesn't come easily to us. Um, we don't see the point of putting forth effort. Maybe we ignore feedback. Um, we might feel threatened by the success of others. Um, and particularly fixed mindset is um, essentially where we think that our abilities are established already. Um, so we're, you know, I'm just not good at math. I'm just not good at X. I'm just not good at, at Y. Um, so we don't see that we can grow. And that's what we want for our students to see is that they can grow. We want them to have this growth mindset. So the goal with a growth mindset is to learn, to grow, to embrace challenges, uh, to persist when there are setbacks. Um, and sometimes our students who, you know, uh, school has come easily to them in the past and then all of a sudden they come to college and they get setbacks or maybe they fail something, then they don't know what to do. So we want to foster in them this idea that failing is a part of learning. Um, you know, if you if you have a setback, you just need to keep going. You need to try again, maybe try in a different way. Um, and with a growth mindset, we see effort as a path to mastery. So you don't just show up to class um, and know what you're doing automatically. Um, we need to try. We need to put forth effort in order to master these different subjects. Um, we also learn from feedback when we have a growth mindset because, again, going to that first part, our goal is to learn. So re receiving that feedback is really integral to, to learning and to putting forth that effort to master um, our outcomes. And also, instead of being threatened by the inspiration or being threatened by the success of others, they find inspiration in the success of others. So they see someone else being successful and it's inspiring to them. They want to also be successful. And so it kind of goes back to that effort of, you know, learning, embracing those challenges, persistence, and those things. Um, and so let me post this in the chat. So this is from psychology today at the bottom there, but um, so some instructional techniques or just some tips for fostering that growth mindset um, are, you know, when, when do we praise students? We want to not just praise the result um, of their learning. We want to praise the process of learning as well. Um, and then also, as you had mentioned, um, Clayton about communicating the expectations of outcomes. So we want to have realistic, realistic expectations of our outcomes, and we want to be continuously communicating that with our students so that they know what our expectations are and they can meet them. Um, we want to also establish a culture that culture that promotes effort, learning, and resilience. So we do that throughout the entire class, um, and that's just a uh, something that we need to do. Um, that's going to strengthen that 
mindset in our students. And then we want to facilitate positive self-talk. And that's the the article there this from Psychology Today. Um, so what is the power of self uh, positive self-talk versus negative self-talk? Um, and that growth mindset is fostering that positive self-talk in ourselves. So how can we model that for our students? How can we get them to do that for themselves? One idea is, you know, through reflection. I have my students do learning reflections um, and they reflect on, you know, hey, what did I do? Well, if I could go back and do things differently, what would I do differently? Where do I still need to grow? Um, so there's, there's different ways that you can foster that in students. That's just one idea. Um, so students, the, this is the self-directed learning cycle, um, students beliefs about intelligence and learning. Um, so the cycle starts with assessing what the task is, evaluating our strengths and weaknesses, planning, um, applying strategies to monitor our performance and reflecting and adjusting as needed. Um, so, you know, all of these, all of these steps need to be, um, promoted in our classes in order for students to be able to continually grow. Um, so it's this iterative, learning is iterative. We need to continuously build upon our learning. Um, and we can do that by evaluating what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, how can I leverage my strengths, um, how can I improve upon my weaknesses, make that plan, um, and then monitor how well that plan went. So did my plan work out? Did it not work out? Why do I think it did or didn't work out? Reflect on that and then adjust as we go through that process again, that cycle again. So with assessing the task, when a student submits um, an assignment that doesn't seem to address the goals of the assignment or the assignment uh, directions, then we might wonder, did the student read the instructions? The student may have read the instructions or may have completed the assignment based on their prior educational experience. Um, they may have failed to correctly assess what they were supposed to do for the assignment. So when students are assessing the task, they need to determine what needs to be done to successfully complete the assignment. So in this first stage of the self-directed learning cycle, um, it's not always a natural step for our students. They're kind of used to just doing things a certain way and they fall into that habit from their prior learning. So rather than following our guidance, they may use a quote unquote like writing as knowledge approach to completing an assignment because that's what they were asked to do in high school. Um, so what they end up doing is just kind of this info dump. They just write all the, that they know about a topic, um, which may not be the goal of that assignment. So they might also use techniques that they used in high school to um, memorize content definitions and terms rather than identifying relationships between concepts or causal impact in specific situations. Um, so they, they fall on, you know, what has been their previous experience with school. And it's a, it's a tough adjustment for students, I think, to come to college and have those different expectations, to be expected to apply things rather than just memorize things, um, to analyze rather than just regurgitate information. So we want to help students learn how to assess these tasks that we're asking them to do. How, how should they approach this and part of that is as Katie mentioned is breaking the task up into smaller tasks maybe um, smaller steps to get them used to doing things in a different way um, practice incorporating that task assessment into their planning for an assignment to develop habits to support their success and provide we want we want to provide feedback on their task assessment before they begin actually working on the assignment so ask them to assess the task tell me what you're supposed to do in this this assignment or in this assessment um, or this activity and assess whether they really understanding before they start working on it and start applying what they think their understanding of the task is. Make sure that they really do understand it so that they're not wasting their time and then you're not getting frustrated with um, them not following the instructions or assessing the task properly. So after assessing the task, we need to have students um, assess their own strengths and weaknesses in terms of how they are prepared to successfully complete that task. Whoops. Sorry. Um, 
here we go. Um, so the research says that people are not their best at assessing their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, so our students' skills with assessing their own strengths and weaknesses is still developing. And um, also students with weaker knowledge and skills are less effective at assessing their strengths and weaknesses than students with higher levels of knowledge and skills, which is kind of, you know, makes our jobs a little bit more difficult if they're not as effective, if they, you know, if they have weaker knowledge and skills, they're not going to be effective at assessing what those weaknesses and those strengths are. So we need to help them with that. Um, so there was actually a study conducted of students in an intro psychology course and students who had a thorough understanding of the content and the complexities of the topic were actually able to accurately predict their performance on the test that was coming up. But students who had a lower level of understanding of the content grossly overestimated their ability to perform successfully on that test. Um, so they thought they were prepared, but they were not prepared. So to help students assess their own strengths and weaknesses, we could do things like practice tests um, or in-class activities that we can use to review the concepts um, or the application of concepts that'll be on a test, for example. Um, and then that can show students you know, maybe they thought they were ready, but they take this practice test and they realize, oh, OK, I'm not as ready as I thought I was. Um, and if students don't know the information that's covered in those practice tests or those in-class activities, then they can focus on those concepts when they're studying for the, the actual test. Um, so we want to focus on the specific knowledge, skills and abilities that are required for success on a particular assessment in whatever we do to help students prepare for that assessment. So, for example, um, do students need to define a term or do they need to know how terms or concepts relate to other terms and con concepts and the impact of you know, changing a variable on the situation that we're addressing. So we want whatever we use to as a, like a formative assessment or um, something that's leading up to or helping our students prepare for our assessments, our summative assessments, we want it to accurately reflect what we're going to be asking them to do on that ultimate assessment. Um, so make sure, making sure that they, not just that they know the information, but that they're able to apply it in the way that we're going to be asking them to apply it. Um, so if, if students are overestimating their competence, then a few things might happen. They might start the assignment at the last minute, um, procrastinate, that can result in poor performance if they do not really have the knowledge that they think they have. Um, and if students think that their success and competence in a certain knowledge area or skill transfers to the skills or the knowledge that are going to be addressed on the test, but they really don't know the test content, then they might also perform at a much lower, lower level than they predicted. Um, so we want to help students, particularly students who think that they're well prepared but actually aren't, um, get an accurate assessment of their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and again, we can do that through things like um, like it says here on this, the uh, slide, practice tests, in-class activities, um, starting an assignment with ample time to complete it before the last minute. Um, and that, again, goes back to, you know, maybe for a bigger assignment, breaking it up into smaller pieces, having multiple due dates instead of one final due date so that we can kind of force our students not to do things at the last minute or at least not do everything at the last minute. You know, of course, we'll have students who for each of those smaller assignments, they're going to wait until the last minute, but then at least they're building upon each other and we're spreading them out a little bit. Um, and then also helping them with knowledge of the skills that are required for the assignment and how they align with their individual skills. Um, so for example, like how can they explain complex relationships rather than just be able to highlight important points or, or key ideas? Um, so the effectiveness of our students planning can be compromised by limitations in the prior two steps of the self-directed learning cycle. So the assessing the task and assessing their strengths and weaknesses. Planning can go awry in a couple of different ways. So first, 
way that it could go awry is they may not plan enough to address the task or uh, in depth enough to address the complexities of that task. And then another way that it might go awry is that they might plan inappropriately for the current situation. So if students, again, if students are overestimating their knowledge, skills, and abilities, they may start the assignment the night before it's due, which can have negative outcomes. They didn't plan enough time to fully address the assignment because they didn't understand what um, it was going to entail and they overestimated their ability to do it. So an example, um, maybe some novice students in a chemistry class um, who spend almost no time planning and starting the assignment by trying various formulas and equations to try to find a solution. They waste significant amounts of time that was not wasted by expert or graduate students who had planned the assignment, identified the appropriate equations and formulas sufficiently and successfully completed the assignment. So when we incorporate planning into the assignment review, the students can then practice that plan and hone their skills throughout the semester. So for example, um, this might take the form of, you know, having them write a proposal um, for a paper instead of just turning in a rough draft of a term paper. Um, you know, we can go over the proposal with them. They, we can make them set up a timeline for, you know, how they're going to get work done and when they're going to get their work done. Um, we can have them outline multiple deliverables that they're going to send to us for review as they're going along to make sure that they're on the right track. So if we can establish that throughout the semester, then by the end of the semester, those habits are going to be more natural and hopefully students will perform better on their assignments. So after students have developed their plan, then they need to monitor their performance on the implementation of that plan. They can ask themselves, and I keep accidentally clicking buttons, they can ask themselves questions such as, um, you know, is this plan working for me? What adjustments do I need to make to support my success? Um, without this, this kind of monitoring, students might keep doing this ineffective plan and not be successful on the assignment. So we want to build in this opportunity for reflection and assessing their performance and the, the effectiveness of the plan throughout um, while they're implementing that plan. So if students are struggling, for example, maybe they should then look into support resources available at NIU rather than continuing to struggle without knowing how to proceed effectively. Um, you know, if you're not teaching a writing class, but you have them writing a paper um, and they're having difficulty with that and that's not something that you're going to be covering in the class and they are struggling with that, maybe they can go to the writing center um, and get some tutoring help there. Um, research shows that students who monitor their performance and try to explain to themselves what they're doing, how they're doing and what's needed, tend to have greater learning gains that students than students do, who do not monitor their own performance. Um, so it's that metacognition, that thinking about thinking, that continuously thinking about why they're doing what they're doing. Um, re research also shows that when students are taught to ask themselves a series of self-comprehension monitoring questions during reading, they learn to self-monitor more often and they learn more from what they read. Um, so that's another strategy to get students um, to read more productively too. I mean, I have a lot of students who try to, you know, they'll read the same thing over and over again because they don't know how to read that text. So we have to teach them, okay, how do you read an academic text? What are some of the strategies? What are some of those reading strategies that will help you retain the information, find out what's important in the reading, and then understand that a little bit better. Um, so again, some questions that we want our students to ask themselves, is this plan working for me? Do I need to adjust the plan to be more productive? Um, so maybe they overestimated their ability to get things done in a certain amount of time. Do I need to adjust that timetable? Um, do I need support? Should I talk to the professor or the TA or tutoring or writing center um, or academic advising? Uh, do I understand the content or do I need to return to the course materials and maybe study more about XYZ concept? And then even when students are monitoring their performance and identi uh, identify maybe deficiencies, 
they might not adjust their approach because it's comfortable. They already know what they're doing. You know, they already know the approach. It's a lot harder to come up with a different approach than it is just keep going, even if it's not working. Um, so there might be some resistance if they were successful in high school, for example, using a certain study and test taking technique, they may not trust why they should change their technique. Um, or they might not be aware of different strategies that they could use. So sharing, uh, you know, NIU student success resources broadly can help those students know that NIU has those resources to support their success, that there are other, are other maybe more um, effective ways to study, for example. Um, research has shown that good problem solvers try different techniques to solve problems rather than using the same strategy without success. So communicating that with students um, because changes won't occur if students perceive that the cost of changing their technique is too high. So maybe they don't want to spend the extra time. Maybe they feel uncomfortable not being, you know, proficient or skilled in that new technique. They don't want to feel uncomfortable. Um, so busy schedules, procrastination, prone students, they may not be willing to invest the time up front to learn those new strategies unless they perceive the payoff is going to be worth their effort. So in my classes, for example, I have students read about and then practice different ways of taking notes. Um, you know, so annotation, SQ4R, different reading strategies and note taking strategies, and then reflect on them and, you know, did this help you understand the course material better? Did you have to read the material over again less often um, to understand what was going on? Um, so giving them the opportunity to practice those things and then reflect on their success um, is also um, very helpful. So some questions that um, you might want to have students ask themselves, um, is this technique working? Am I learning the content successfully solving the problems, et cetera? Do I know a different technique to solve this problem? If they don't, then can we help with that? Um, and what resources are available to help them solve the challenges that they're experiencing with that content? Whether it's discipline specific or more general resources on campus. <clears throat> um, so let's talk a little bit about what you think students um, can do to practice self-directed learning in your classes. Maybe if there's anything that we brought up today um, that kind of sparked something like, hey, I have an idea for something that I'd like to try, um, or what can you do to support students as self-directed learners? I appreciated the part just about learning about their perspective, like maybe they were thinking what they did in high school worked just fine, or um, how you mentioned introducing different studying techniques. Mm -hmm. So I think both of those would be good strategies, talking about what they've done before and then, you know, how can we try some other things and promote that growth mindset? Yeah, and, uh, you know, along those same lines, they might not know that there are different expectations for their learning um, in our classes in college. Um, and do we want them to learn the hard way by failing? Um, I mean, they might fail anyways, but or do we want to kind of bring that up at the beginning? You know, so how do you study? How do you normally study or how did you study in high school? Well, you know, what kind of studying is that good for? So like that might be really effective if you're learning, if you want to do this or if you're required to do this on the test. But if you're required to do this other thing on the test, that's not really going to work. So how can we find a strategy that'll work for what you're going to be asked to do on tests in this class? Are there any undergrad courses that are designed to kind of teach like freshmen just basic academic habits? Um, UNIV 101 is one of those. It's a one credit hour class, I believe. We're in the um, kind of in the process of um, rethinking the UNIV 101 class too to make it uh, serve, help it serve students better. But that is one that we recommend. It 
kind of helps with study habits and, you know, those kinds of things that particularly for students who are um, first generation college students is really helpful and helps them become aware of different services and resources on campus and things like that. Mm -hmm. I only teach one undergrad class, uh, but it is a 400 level and mm -hmm. I'm always just blown away by the fact that a lot of students just have no idea how to study mm -hmm. or how to prepare for an exam. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, how long have you been been teaching um, the the class? Like how many years? Uh, 13 years. 13 years. So you've seen like before pandemic versus, have you noticed like a difference like post pandemic versus pre pandemic? Like, does it seem to be more of a problem um, now or is it kind of been consistent? It's been pretty consistent overall. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, that class, the UNIV 101 class is not required. Um, and so students can take it or not. Um, and then, you know, it just depends on what classes they're they're taking. Um, you know, maybe someone will cover study skills in a class, um, discipline specific study skills, maybe they won't. Um, and then, you know, the other challenge with with students is getting them to transfer their knowledge. So they might, you know, they get in that habit of, okay, my class, the class is over, I can forget everything. And I do deal with this because I teach first year composition and teach, you know, composition one and then composition two. And I know what I taught you in composition one and you're not applying that in composition two because they see them as kind of discrete courses and they don't see, don't recognize that they need to continue they need to remember that thing those things that they learned in that previous class and then apply them as they move forward um, so that's the other big challenge I think is getting them to retain that knowledge that they probably did learn um, but then they kind of disregard it after they take that final exam mm -hmm. and think they can just forget about it because they passed that class yeah which is frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, and I, you know, uh, you know, it might just be coming up with some resources and maybe giving them to them at the beginning of the semester, like, hey, you might have learned these study skills in your previous classes in our program. Here's maybe a recap of some effective study skills for, for this class um, without having to spend too much time on that. Mm -hmm. Do you do like practice tests or what kind of assessments do you mainly do? Well, mainly uh, exams, but I do provide uh, like practice quizzes for them mm -hmm. that I basically tell them to use uh, when they study. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I teach them, I go over like five to 10 different techniques for how to study yeah. for exams, um, et cetera. And, you know, you do have a lot of students that are good self-directed learners and they have no problem at all. Um, and then other students that I think, I think it really just comes down to like caring about performing well and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how do we get them to, want to learn <laughs> and to see the value in that, um, especially when you think by the time, you know, you're reaching an upper level course, that sh I don't, you, would, you would think you wouldn't have to do that as much as for, you know, a first year student yep. who's still kind of learning the ropes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that is definitely a big challenge. Um, and yeah, like I, you can write everything out too. You know, I give my students these really detailed instructions and then I get a paper and I'm like, where are half of the requirements of this paper? Um, it's all written there. I've gone over it multiple times, but you know, it's how, how can I do it in maybe a different way that's gonna get them to see how they, how they need to. And you know, that is, that is the challenge because at a certain point they have to meet us 
halfway. We can't do everything for them. So that's, that is, that is a big challenge for sure. Mm -hmm. Especially when you, you give them those, you give them all of the resources, um, but they don't, don't take advantage of it. Um, do you allow for retesting? No. No. That could be one, at least for like an early test. You know, if you um, give them an early test and then allow them to retake that test and, you know, if they get a poor grade. Because um, I know sometimes, too, if a student gets a bad grade on the first test, then they're like, well, that kind of reinforces their fixed mindset of, well, I'm just not good at this and I've just blown it for the entire semester. So why keep trying? Um, or why try in the first place if I'm, you know, so maybe giving them an opportunity maybe on the first test to redo it, like, hey, you didn't do so well. Why do we think that was? Get them to think about their learning, like, how did you study for it? Why do you think that wasn't successful? Okay, try this study strategy and then come back and retake the test. Just an idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other thoughts about? you know, how we can maybe strategies that we can use to practice that self-directed learning with our students. Um, just like I said before, kind of talking about different learning styles and different ways of doing things because maybe they haven't tried something that will work for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and our students, and maybe this is a problem with with the students in the 400 level class, maybe they've gotten, you know, by on those study strategies for the past couple of years. And they, you know, at this point, they're kind of, they've, well, they passed those classes, I got to see. So why, why change? Why put forth that effort? Um, to, to do this and maybe it's getting them to think ahead maybe um or do you to mostly teach like majors yes yeah okay do you mostly teach majors too yes yeah so maybe getting them instead of looking backwards at okay well maybe this worked for you in the past but now that we're getting into these upper level classes we need to start thinking about the future. What do you want your profession to be? Do you want to be able to do it well? <laughs> if you do, then we need to start right now rethinking because just because you get through this program doesn't mean you're going to get a job or that you're going to get, you know, that you're going to keep a job if you do get it, if you're not going to do it well. Um, so, you know, maybe reframing it, finding out what they value and then appealing to that might work too. Any questions that you have for me um, or any resources that you want me to look for that I can um, provide for you in my follow up email? Do you have uh, any, you know, like pre made assignments or anything, you know, related to the self directed learning? I can come, yeah, I can get, I can get compile that for you and, and send that in my follow up. That'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was my first workshop I've ever attended, so it was just good to talk about some different ideas, especially kind of interdepartmental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you think of any questions or, you know, anything like a specific scenario comes up that you want to run past someone, anyone on our team, but I'm also available anytime. You can email me um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or find solutions or find resources for you um, to help with, you know, whether it's self-directed learning or some other pedagogical need as well. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Amanda, all right. do you do you run yeah. um, all these other programs? Um, I I deliver two workshops a month usually, and then I coordinate the um, scheduling of the other workshops. 
So, and if there's any workshop ideas that you have too, like any subjects that you want us to cover, you know, we mm -hmm. can, we definitely take suggestions as well. If there's okay. a demand for something, we'll offer it. Okay. Even if it's like a 2.0, like the next steps. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. And again, um, you can contact me anytime. My emails there got a little wonky. <laughs> um, Amanda.smothers at niu.edu. Um, or you can just contact us um, at CIDL, um, especially if you have, you know, a technology need, um, just contact CIDL. And then the first person, that's the best way, the first person who's available will get to that question. Um, but any other questions that aren't time sensitive, you can send to anybody in our team and we'll get back to you on those. Um, you can schedule one-to-one -one on one -on -one consultations with any of us. Um, you know, our, we've got upcoming workshops. We'll be scheduling our November workshops soon. So if you have any workshops or topics that you want us to cover, let us know and we'll try to get those in in November or December. Um, and then our work, our website has a lot of resources as well, niu.edu slash CITL or CITL.niu.edu. Either one works. All right. Um, thanks so much for coming today um, to talk about self-directed, developing self-directed learners. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact us and I hope to see you at some future workshops. And thanks for coming to your first workshop with CITL. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Amanda. Have a great Have a rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye.